Let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 23 as we begin with uh, David's song. Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, he that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Um, Last words of David. These weren't the last things he said, so there's a lot of speculation over what that means. Um, because he said a lot of other things after this, including having, giving uh, advice to his son Solomon. Uh, he gave instructions on building the temple. It, it might it perhaps mean that uh, these are the last prophetic words of David under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit after he finished the book of Psalms. And God has an ideal for a leader, and, and in some ways... David's reign was a disaster. You know, uh, there was repeated family crises. Uh, uh, the attempted, he just, we just went through the attempted overthrow of his son by his son, Absalom. There was civil war. There was three years of famine. Uh, Solomon had what would look like a very idyllic reign, uh, great prosperity, prominence in the world, um, really glory. And the Bible often praises David, because he did. He was a man after God's own heart. Um, Psalm 89.20, for example, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. Isaiah 55.3 and 4, incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader in a commandment to the people. Uh, In the New Testament, in in Romans 1, 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And then last book of the Bible, Revelation 22, 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify, unto, to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the shining star. And uh, David is mentioned three to four times as many times as Solomon. And uh, David's passion in life was to be with God. In Psalm, when he wrote Psalm 8410, he said, For a day in the courts in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So David had a lot of things that he faced, a lot of difficult things. He endured to the end, uh, loving and serving the Lord. Solomon, his son, who looked like he was off to a great roaring start, uh, he uh, forsook the Lord in his later years, sadly. And we'll be going through that on Wednesdays, doing through the book of 1 Kings. But 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, verse 4 says, For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So David had some bad behaviors, but his heart was towards the Lord. And uh, a ruler that rules in the fear of God is a light to the people. And uh, this is one of the points that uh, he's making clear here, is they have to be under the headship of God. Uh, Verse 5, Although my heart, I'm sorry, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Who's that everlasting covenant through? Jesus. Uh, Ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation. And all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of the spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. 
David looks ahead to the Messiah's reign as he realizes that <clears throat> he's not the greatest example of righteousness. At the same time, God stays faithful to his promises, the covenant that he has made. Verse 8, I'm going to read through to verse 12. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was the Dino, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. You read that and you think, this must be a misprint. One guy took down 800 people? And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Yehohite. I'm sure Dodo had a different connotation in those days. One of the three mighty men with David, <coughs> pardon me, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto his sword. That means, you know, if you hold something long enough, you have to peel your fingers off it. His hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil or to take what was valuable. And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. There was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. And he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. So we have a description of some of David's mighty men. <coughs> Pardon me. His top three soldiers, if you will, Adino, Eliezer, and Shema, and uh at the same time he's giving recognition to them, David doesn't forget that the real source of the victory was the Lord. He says, the Lord brought a great victory. And that's true in our lives, too. When there's a victory, it's the Lord's. We have a tendency to take credit for some things that only the Lord can do. And the three, and three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in hold, and the garrison, garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. And these things did these three mighty men. Um, it's a reference to the Philistine war back in Second Samuel chapter 5. And uh, out of his 30 mighty men, these guys were mighty, mighty and uh, they did a very daring thing, willing to risk their lives <clears throat> to get a drink for David, to quench his thirst. A, a real example of loyalty and devotion to David. But, but David knew it wasn't he who's getting the victory here. You know, he's just he's the leader of the soldiers, but he didn't accomplish this all by himself because even leaders need support and uh we look at David's attitude toward this water that these men risked their lives for and got it back to him, uh, and it was too precious to him to drink. How interesting. Not too precious to pour out to the Lord, but too precious to drink. Because he says, uh, you know, everybody here is thirsty. It's war. I can't drink. I'm going to pour this out as a sacrifice. And only the Lord really is worthy of that kind of a sacrifice. Uh, I like what uh, uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12:1, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that I present that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he wants us to present ourselves, really, basically, uh, our, our bodies a living sacrifice. Um, just an interesting side note here that he drew water from Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. So they took the water from the house of bread, Bethlehem. And um, in John 6.35, Jesus said, 
I am the bread of life, and he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. John 7:38. He that believes on him on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Christ is that living water that comes into us and flows through us and out of us. Verse 18. Uh, read right through to 23. And Abishai, the, son, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them, and had the, the name among three. Now here's a, quite a scorekeeping thing, isn't it? Eight hundred by one and three hundred by another. Murder, killings. <laughs> was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain, howbeit he attained not unto the first three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the, pit, in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a godly man, and the I'm sorry, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a shaft and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. He was a good fighter. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three, and David sent him over, set him over his guard. So here we see here of uh, two other mighty men, of David and their exploits, Abishai and Benaiah. And uh, Abishai, famous for his battle against 300 men, uh, his leadership is also recorded in other passages. Benaiah, he's famous for his battles against both lion-like men. I, we don't know exactly what he means. Does that mean they had long, blonde, flowing hair? Don't know. But uh, obviously they were very vicious. They were very good in battle. And he also killed a real lion getting down into a hole uh, of snow and uh, killing this lion with his bare hands or the weapons he had on him. Um, that's quite a feat when you think about it. If you could picture yourself locked in a room like this with a lion and uh, you have a knife perhaps. Uh, no, it takes quite a guy to do that. Verse 30, or 24. I'm going to read right through to 39 now. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was one of the thirty. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shammah, the Herodite, Elika, the Herodite, Helaz, the Peltite, Ira, the son of Ikish, uh, the Tekoite, <clears throat> Abiezer, the Anathathite, Anathathite, Mebunia, uh, the Hushathite, Zaldman, the Ahohite, uh, Maherai, the Netophathite, he lived the son of Baana, the Netophathite, Netophathite, Itai, the son of Ribai, out of Gibeah, uh, of the children of, Israel, of Benjamin. If I mispronounce any of these, just tell me afterwards, okay? <laughs> Benai, the, the pirate, or the Parathonite, <laughs> Hedai, of the brooks of Gaish, Abialban, the Abathite, uh, as Maveth, the bear humite, Ella, Elia, Eliaba, the Shalbanite, and the sons of Jason, Jonathan, Shama, the Hararite, Ahiam, the sons of Sharar, the Hararite, Eliphalet, the son of Abish, the son of Abish, Ahashbai, the son of the Maacathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gileonite, uh, the Gilonite. Hezrei, the Carmelite, Perei, the Arbite. You might wonder, what, why all these names? Well, there's a, there's a significance to naming these mighty men. Igal, the son of Nathan of Zobah. Bani, the Gadite. Zelek, the Ammonite. Neherai, the Beerothite. An armor bearer to Joab, the son of Jeruiah. Ira, an Ithrite. And Gareb, an Ithrite. Uriah, the Hittite. Thirty and seven of all. Thirty mighty men listed. Uh, heard of first in uh, second. I'm sorry, First Samuel chapter 22. I want to read the first two verses. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam, 
And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So David has this band. And who are they? Those in distress. Those in debt. Those who were discontent. Those who were dissatisfied with Saul. They, these are the ones that gathered around David. He was obviously quite a leader. And notice that the last man listed here was Uriah the Hittite. That was the uh, uh, husband of Bathsheba. Remember the story of Bathsheba, whom David sent to his death in war. So Second um, Samuel 24, we'll look at the last chapter here. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the king of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye, or count ye, the people, that I may know the number of the people. So David takes a uh, census. And uh, most of the commentators think that this he that he's speaking of is the devil himself as in 1 Chronicles 21.1, that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So you've got to ask, well, did God move David to sin? Does God provoke to sin? Does he provoke to evil? No, he doesn't. James 1.13 through 16, I don't have the notes for tonight for you, but let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Then what's happening here? Well, one of the things we can consider is, uh, I'm going to look back and I'll read you Exodus 7, verses 13 and 14. As we hear that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them. And the Lord said, um, as the Lord said, and the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. And oftentimes, what God will do, he'll he'll see somebody who's hardening their heart, and he'll allow it to go that way. And I think that's what is going on here. In this case, a a hardening of David's heart. He wanted to know how many people were there. And he stepped forward and and had them numbered. And uh, verses 3 and 4, And Joab said to the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people, how many soever they be, a hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. So Joab steps up and he, he objects to this sentence. I'm sorry, this census. And he's overruled by David. Verse 5. And it passed, or they passed over Jordan and uh, pitched in Aroa on the right side of the city that lies in the midst of the river Gad and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim Hochi, and they came to Danjan, and about to Zidon, and, and came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites, and of the Canaanites, and they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. So, when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days, and Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people of under the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So this sentence is t- census is taken, and uh, the count comes up to about, uh, of the 12 tribes, a million 300,000 fighting men, the total population they estimated around 6 million, according to the commentators. In verse 10, in the king's heart, David's heart smote him 
after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. So David senses his guilt. He feels his guilt. He confesses his guilt to the, to the Lord. He knows he's done wrong. You might say, well, why? What's wrong with the census? Well, it should only be done when commanded by the Lord. David was only to count what he owned. And Israel belongs to, to God. It doesn't belong to David. Um, and the principle here is that we think we own things. We all have possessions. But the fact is they all belong to the Lord because he's the one that uh, he, he owns it all. In Luke chapter 12, I want to read some verses to you, 16 through 21, Luke 12. Jesus spoke a parable saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? In other words, his barns were full of grain. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that, that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And it's basically keep your focus on the Lord and not on your worldly goods. And uh, knowing that Israel's population could be a source of pride and confidence to David, um, God was angry with David and Israel, but why was he angry? Uh, apparently, they had this pride. They had this vainglory, this self-confidence in their hearts. And uh, it's often asked, well, who did this? Was it God that did this or was it uh, Satan that did this? Well, God allowed it for his purpose to expose the sin, to expose the pride, and to expose the self-reliance. And uh, it was already in God's, uh, in Israel's heart and in David's heart. And it does appear here that God is allowing Satan to prompt David to take this sentence to show the heart of David into Israel of being departed from the Lord to an extent. So God allowed to David to do what his heart desired. Interesting. Oftentimes people think, well, I got away with it, you know, so <laughs> I guess it's okay. No, God is gracious, and he's merciful, and he allows. Verse 11. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. So God's saying, I'm going to pour a judgment out on you. And here are the three judgments. Pick which one you want. Door one, door two, or door three, you know. <laughs> Uh, seven years of famine, three months running away from your enemies, or three days of plague. He wasn't given the choice, none of the above. Okay, He had to choose. Choose your own punishment. And, you know, we know that the Lord is in charge of justice. And uh, oftentimes we, we don't look at it as justice, but uh, the, David and the people's heart was uh, drifting from the Lord and and uh, he was meeting out some justice. In verse 14, And David said to Gad, I'm in a great strait. That's, I'm in a rock, between a rock and a hard place here. It's, it's, I'm, in a, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. And so David places himself in God's people at God's mercy, basically showing great trust in the Lord. And it's good to remember an Old Testament verse here, Lamentations. I don't know how often you read Lamentations, maybe at night when you're trying to fall asleep. But uh, Lamentations 3, 21 through 23 says, 
This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Isn't that amazing? uh, His compassions are new every morning. They don't fail. Uh, It's by his mercies that we're not consumed. Because remember what mercy is, not getting what we deserve. Verse 15 through 17. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba. 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Aruna, the Jebusite. And David spoke unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. The thing is that when we sin, it affects affects everybody who's close to us. I sometimes equate it to a, uh, you know what an M80 is? It's a really powerful explosive, like dropping that into a gallon of paint in a room full of people. Whoever's closest gets touched by it. And sin's like that. It touches those people who are close to us not only brings grief to the sinner, but to those who are close. And David here, he's recognizing the responsibility of his leadership. Um, A plague hits Israel, 70,000 people die. And I was thinking, 70,000 people, how do we relate to that? And I was looking looking up uh, on the computer, the population of different cities around New, uh, New York, for example, Schenectady, I, I don't know a lot about Schenectady, but it has 67,000 people. It would be like wiping out the whole city of Schenectady, 67,000, because 70,000 men died. But David intercedes for his people here. He, he, he asks for the punishment to be brought upon him, upon him and his whole household. Moses did the same thing, but God has other plans. Verse 18. And Gad came that, that day to David and said unto him, Go up. Rear an altar unto the Lord, or build an altar, in the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So here's David. He, he ends up with this threshing floor, builds, a, builds an altar, and the plague stopped. And just an interesting trivia about this spot here. This is where Solomon's temple was ultimately built. This is where Abraham and Isaac were on the hill, remember, and uh, Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac in Genesis 22. This is also very close to where Jesus died on the cross. It's in this set of hills here. So verse 22 through 24. And, and Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king <clears throat> take and offer up what seems good to him. Behold, here be an ox for burnt sacrifice and, and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna as, as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. So David uh, uh, refused Aruna's gift, but takes the uh, end up buying the threshing floor. And it uh, shows a principle here that we need to give more to the Lord than what is convenient. And God deserves our sacrifices. Remember, what, uh, I think I've quoted this already 
chapter or 12, verse 1 of, of Romans. Beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God and uh, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So in David, here we are at the end of the chapter, and David built there an altar, an altar unto the Lord, and, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plagued plague was stayed from Israel. So David builds the altar, offers sacrifices that are pleasing to God, pleasing to God, instead of trying to determine in his own heart what it is, and the plague is withdrawn. And he's going to take, ultimately David will pass his kingdom on to Solomon, but David's greatest legacy, because he was chosen of God to do this, is his greater son. As the New Testament begins in Matthew 1.1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. In other words, the descendant of David. And uh, I think one of the things we can take away from this is that sinning can harden us to sin, but many today sin without remorse, without any guilt feelings. I remember someone saying to me, well, I don't like going to church because I don't like to feel guilty. And I said, well, it's appropriate to feel guilty if you're guilty of something. You know, <laughs> Just didn't come back. Um, if people can sin without feeling bad, that's bad. And their heart can be hardened towards sin or, or maybe encouraged towards sin. And, and if, you, if you feel bad because you've sinned, that's good. We should feel bad. We should feel guilty if we're guilty. But then we can follow David's example here. He confessed his sin. And, and if we confess our sin, we'll be forgiven. Remember 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But hiding sin makes it worse. I bet you can finish the half, the second half of this. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Yeah. Confessing our sin. Confessing our sin gets our forgiveness. It gets that sin forgiven. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I received a phone call recently of someone who was try, trying to understand forgiveness in Christ and, and uh, heaven and all that. And when I explained it, he said, oh, wow, that's easier than I thought. I said, yeah, but you got to believe. you got to believe. But confession without repentance, that's worthless too. I mean, our mouth can speak anything, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It can either speak lies if we're not close to Christ, or it can speak truth. Because confession without repentance is worthless. To repent means to change, to turn 180 degrees in the direction we were going in our thoughts and our actions towards the Lord. Then we go back toward the Lord. David said he'd done foolishly. Well, all sin is foolishness, isn't it? And yet all sin and come short of the glory of God. Not confessing it to God is foolishness because he sees all things and he knows all things. In fact, he's known about it from before the foundation of the world. John six twenty eight and 29, I'll read it. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. What? Just believe, but what must... Notice they ask, what shall we do? And that's and when, when we get paid for working, we have done something. We do things. We're used to doing things, not just believing things. Yeah, I believe I can get to work. Will you pay me if I believe I can get there? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but when we believe that Christ died and that uh, uh, we believe in him who he has sent, we confess our sins to God. We are forgiven, as First John 1, 9 says. And God's forgiveness is not, you don't have to keep sacrificing. Remember, Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. His forgiveness is complete. Cleansing us from all unrighteousness is complete. And when we trust in the Lord, we will be, as it says in Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord... Uh, uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you've given us something we can do, which is to believe, but not to do. But we do have to do that, believe. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the gift of faith, that we can exercise that faith. And uh, 
Lord, I pray that when you bring anyone into our path that doesn't know you but wants to know you, Lord, I pray you to give us the words supernaturally that are just perfect for that person to hear for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen.